Once again, you're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. I hope that you have on your thinking caps tonight, ladies and gentlemen, because I fully intend to exercise that muscle between your ears as it has never been exercised before. Due to some of the phone conversations and questions asked by the listening audience last night, I have uh, put together this broadcast. Remember that when you play with religion, you are playing with your immortal soul. You must learn to determine the truth for yourself rather than trust, trust, trust some other person to do the right thing that you will have to deal with for all eternity. Beloved, your election of God. Paul told them that he knew that they were the elect of God. Is there any chance that these people could have also been the ones that Christ was talking about in Matthew 24 when he said that there should be no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days should be shortened? How was it that Paul was so convinced of their election that he knew it. He knew it. Paul had read Matthew 24 when Christ said, Behold, I have told you before. Now there's no doubt in my mind that the elect of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 4 and the elect of Matthew chapter 24 verse 22 are one and the same. Check 1 Thessalonians Chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. For they themselves shew of us what manner of entering we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Verse 10. And to wait for his Son from heaven, who he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now was Paul giving them 
a lie? Was he deceiving them? Was he misguiding them in their hope for the future? As Christ supposedly misled his disciples in Matthew 24, as we discussed on Friday night. I don't understand how we can even begin to believe anything other than what is so plainly stated in the Bible. Now, for those of you who may just be turning in or tuning in, I've been saying turning in a lot late, haven't I? Maybe it's because I need to be turning in a little bit earlier. For those of you who may just be tuning in, on Friday night we began a discussion about how we are being deceived by our leaders, by our ministers, by our pastors, by our churches, by many people, many organizations, many groups, some intentional, some not so intentional, but all leading us in one direction. And that is to expect a new heaven and a new earth in the very near future. The new earth to be ruled by Jesus Christ himself. A one world government, in fact. And, you know, <clears throat> If you consider yourself to be one of the elect, <laughs> you'd better listen to me. And I'm not trying to shove my religion down your throat. I have questions about these things myself. The purpose of this is try to reach some feeling of what the truth might be. I'm looking for the truth, and I hope you are too. I'm not trying to insult anyone or hurt anyone or tell you that your religion is wrong or that your beliefs are wrong. Not at all. And whether you're a Christian, an atheist, a Buddhist, a Jew, doesn't matter who you are, you should pay attention to this tonight because I think we can all learn something from it. If not, bring those of us who are Christians a little closer to Christ give those who are not Christians a better understanding of what real Christianity really is. Because I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, it is not being taught in your churches. So, give this a hearing. Don't turn off your radio and don't turn off your ears. Hear it out. Think about it. Look up the verses that we discussed. And see if there are not some points being made here. Because if there are, then uh, there's a lot of people on the wrong track. And it could affect you <laughs> for all eternity if you believe that. <clears throat> Let's look at verses 13 through 20 of chapter 2. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye have heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh in you that believe. In verse 14, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Verse 15, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men. Verse 16. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might fill up their sins alway, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. These past few verses, ladies and gentlemen, have to be reckoned with. Paul has told the Thessalonians that he knows about their persecutions. He knows about all of the tribulations that they are being put through. And he says about the ones who have done the persecuting, the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Can you get any more wrath than the uttermost? Is not this almost word for word what Christ talked about in Matthew 24? The wrath is come. That is present tense. He said, the wrath is come, present tense. He told them that the wrath is come, and that was 2,000 years ago. 
In verse 17, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. In verse 18, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. And verse 19, For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? What? Paul told them that they would be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. Do you understand what you just heard? Paul was telling them that their persecutions would end at the coming of Christ. And this was the hope that the Thessalonian church was looking for. This was what sustained their faith throughout all of the terrible persecutions that they were going through at that time. You see, Paul told them that they would be in Christ's presence at His coming. Now, was this just another in a long line of misrepresentations? How many did we cover Friday night? Reading verbatim from the Bible. Is all of what we've been taught about the New Testament based on lies and misrepresentations? If the Thessalonians did not go through all that was promised to them, was that not an unbelievably cruel thing for Paul to do to a group of sincere, Christ-loving, God-serving, persecuted people? People who might be dead the next hour or the next day. In verse 2, Paul tells them that he sent Timotheus to establish them and to comfort them concerning their faith. In verse 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Paul said that they knew that that is what they were supposed to go through. Christ told them in Matthew 24 that they would be delivered up to be afflicted and to be persecuted. And the words are almost identical to those found in Matthew 24. In verse 4 he tells them, For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass and ye know. Now it has to be noted that 1 Thessalonians was written during the same generation in which Christ spoke of in Matthew 24 when he said in verse 34, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. He was talking to his disciples and he said, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Matthew 24 spoke of, and I quote, the end of the world, end quote. And we discussed the true meaning of that word on Friday night in the original Greek translation. He also talked about the destruction of the temple and the coming of Christ. And to this point, we have seen the persecutions, afflictions, tribulations, hope of the coming Christ, and the evidence that all of these things happened during the lives of the Thessalonian Christians. During their lives, in their generation. So let's continue with chapter 3 to see if there are any more points of special interest related to this subject. We can see in verse 7 that Paul was happy to note that these Christians were, quote, keeping their faith unto the end, end quote. They were enduring unto the end. Now, if you'll just look at verses 11 through 13. Now, God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. In verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. And verse 13, to the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Do you understand what he's saying? In verse 13, he said, To the end he may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. 
And uh, in chapter 4, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. And in verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, how can your ministers be teaching you the truth when those people who lived in that time and wrote these words said this? Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Is this another cruel misrepresentation? Paul told them that they would witness and be part of this blessed event. Paul told them that many of them would be alive and remaining and be caught up together with them in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Did God keep his word to those Thessalonian Christians 2,000 years ago? Or was it all a hoax to keep them from falling away under the tremendous persecution? that they were under. You know, a lion can instill dreadful fear. Why is it so difficult to believe God's word for exactly what it says? Paul very plainly says that he's doing the talking and they are the ones receiving the letter. How can we say that those words were really meant for a future generation? Well, if you can trust Schofield with your eternal soul, then I guess you can believe whatever you want and that the entire scope of what we have read and studied in Matthew 24 and in the book of 1 Thessalonians Friday night and tonight was a misguided riddle that was probably designed to keep those early Christians buoyed up above fear and anxiety, giving them a false hope in order to make our generation feel that somehow all of these verses are for us to help us through the tremendous sufferings and persecutions that we are going through. In other words, Paul lied to them, if you believe Schofield. But you see, if you really believe that the Bible is truth, then Paul could not have lied. So you're faced with a dilemma. As we gorge ourselves around the table at dinner time and drive our $20,000 cars and $10,000 cars and $2,000 cars and live in our fancy homes and our church buildings such as the Crystal Cathedral and, and the, uh, the Mormon Temple or multi-million dollar superstructures with padded pews, air conditioning, heating and fleets of Greyhound buses to carry us on our tours. And when I'm, if I mention your church... Folks, I'm not trying to insult you. I'm trying to bring home a point. We have state-of-the-art gymnasiums and athletic facilities that rival anything, anywhere. We're filthy rich. And yet the teachings of the New Testament regarding persecution and the deliverance received from the second coming of Christ refers to us? How could we be so deceived? Couldn't possibly be referring to us. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. And in verse 2, for yourselves, and this is chapter 5, by the way, verse 2, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. 
Now, why did Paul tell them that he really didn't even need to talk to them about the time and the seasons, and that they knew perfectly well about the day of the Lord? Paul didn't need to talk about it because Jesus Christ himself gave clear and concise lessons on the subject in Matthew 24. He said this, Jesus said, When ye therefore, now listen to what I'm saying, When ye therefore shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. And in verse 3, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then the sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And in verse 4, But ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. He's talking to the people directly in front of him, not to some future generation. They were not in darkness because they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that they were the fulfillment of Christ's words in Matthew 24. You see, when those people received the Scriptures, they believed it. They didn't have the opportunity to listen to religious professionals explain away and tell them that what they were reading or listening to actually applied to some future generation some 2,000 years down the road. They believed that when Christ spoke to them and said, Ye, He was talking about them. Because they were the ye that He was talking to. They knew that what they were going through was the fulfilling of Christ's Matthew 24 prophecy. And these things were not surprises to them because of Christ's own words. Listen carefully. Quote, Behold, I have told you before. End quote. And look at verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul again tries to console these suffering saints that they were going to be spared the awful things that were still yet coming. And in verse 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if these people did not see the coming of their Lord Jesus Christ, then truly, ladies and gentlemen, they were the victims of one of the cruelest jokes ever perpetrated on mankind. A hoax, a lie. Wouldn't it just be so much easier to believe that God's Word is true if you believe it's God's Word? You see, I don't believe that these churches that call themselves Christian churches are preaching God's Word are even telling you the truth. And in fact, because of a lot of these things and many more, I don't even believe that they're Christian churches. But that's my belief, and you don't have to believe what I believe. You see, I believe that if the Bible is the inspired Word of God, then the Bible cannot lie. And if the Bible cannot lie, then what it is telling us is the truth. And what it is telling us is 180 degrees away from what our preachers and ministers and churches are telling us. So who is telling the truth? If the Bible is not telling the truth, then you can throw it all out. But if the preachers and ministers and churches are not telling the truth, then there's still a chance for salvation, isn't there? Wouldn't it just be so much easier to believe what you're reading is true? Regardless of the level of our understanding that Jesus has wonderfully fulfilled all of His promises, to that generation? See, I'd much rather believe that Christ and Paul kept their word to those people and that they were not misled or lived and served Christ their Lord under some false or misguided pretenses because if that's true, then I can no longer follow Christ. Nor believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. And I don't see how you could either, but that's your decision to do that. Whatever your decision is, in this country, you have a right to worship and believe at whatever altar and whatever theology you wish to worship at and believe in. And I will certainly fight for your right to do that, whether I believe it or not. So let's take a pause here for a short break and uh, come back and 
continue with this because I think I think that this is extremely important. Thessalonians, folks, I'd like to go back to what we were talking about in the beginning of Friday's broadcast, where I told you that I would show you where the Scripture talks about the end of the Jewish age. I'm going to show you where the Old Testament prophecies say that there will be an end of the Jewish age, and that the disciples knew it, based upon the Old Testament prophecy in Malachi. In the first chapter of Malachi, and in the first verse, we find out who the book is written to. Remember, not one word was written to us, but every word was written for us. Every word in God's book can be used, but we must never forget our responsibility to rightly divide the word of truth. Not just accept, but read and study and use our common sense and our brain to determine what this book is trying to tell us. It is easily seen that when the verse says, quote, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, end quote, it is then our responsibility to believe that it was in fact spoken by God to Malachi to Israel hundreds and hundreds of years ago. You see, it was written to a specific people at a specific time. And since there are prophetic words in the book, we have to ascertain as to whether or not the New Testament gives us conclusive evidence to its fulfillment, or whether there remains unfulfilled prophecies. The book of Malachi begins with Israel questioning God's love and devotion for them through the years. And in verse 2, They begin questioning God because of his choosing Jacob over Esau. In verse 6, God begins somewhat of a dissertation against Israel, saying that honor and fear that should be due him from Israel is actually polluted and contemptible. He's lost all pleasure in them, and he will begin rejecting any of their offerings. He even states in verse 11 that his name is going to be great among the Gentiles and the heathen and that their offerings will be considered pure by him. And in chapter 2, a plea goes out to the priests to make a return to God. He tells them in verse 2 that he has already cursed them because they did not lay his words to heart. If you continue reading the rest of the chapter, and this is chapter 2, so that you can see that Israel was going to end up with judgment from God for all of the terrible wickedness and the disobedience that they returned to God despite all of his wonderful dealings to them. And all throughout the Old Covenant, you can see God dealing with Israel with blessing after blessing, only to have them reject his graciousness time and time again. And verse 1 says, 
This is Malachi 3, the day of the Lord. Verse 1 says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And in verse 2, But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And verse 3, And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And verse 4, Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in former years. And verse 5, And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against the false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear me not, saith the Lord of hosts. So we see, dear listeners, that the day of the Lord is a day of judgment. It is a day of judgment that will come to his temple. It is a day of judgment that will take place as a burning fire. It is also a day where after it is finished, God will truly have an Israel, Judah and Jerusalem, that will be a blessing to him. He will have a people that love and fear his name. Chapter 4 begins to give a little more detail as to when this event will take place. And verse 1 states, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Malachi tells them that this day of judgment that is coming will burn as an oven. When it comes, it will leave them with neither root nor branch. He is talking about complete and utter annihilation. Not only will the branches burn, but the root will also be burned. And that is complete destruction. There will be nothing left of Israel, but just as God has always provided a way of escape for those who obey his word before judgment, verse 2 says this, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness. Note the capital letter at Son, and note that it is spelled S-U-N. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. In verse 3, And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. In verse 4, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And in verse 6, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. From our readings, folks, in Malachi, we can see the following things. One, the book was written to Israel. Two, God tells them that he has rejected them. Three, he tells them that his name will be great among the Gentiles. Four, he tells them that he will corrupt their seed. Five, he tells them that the day of his coming will be suddenly upon the temple. And six, out of this judgment will come a people that truly honor, fear, and serve him. Seven, the day will include utter and complete annihilation. And eight, Christ will provide the healing. Nine, Elijah will be sent before this great and dead, dreadful day comes. Now God promised that before this great and dreadful day of judgment would come, that he would first send Elijah the prophet to Israel. This would be a major sign that the end was upon them and that his words should be obeyed. Now if we go back to the New Testament to see if, just like all of the prophecy that we've already seen thus far, 
both Friday night and tonight. We can find fulfillment within the pages of the Bible. <clears throat> in Matthew 16, Christ and his disciples are in the middle of another confrontation with the Sadducees, the religious leaders in Israel. They had asked Christ to provide them with a sign from heaven. And Christ responded, that only wicked and adulterous generations seek for signs. He asked them why they can't discern the signs of the times. Christ tells his disciples to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Christ warned his disciples that the leaven he was talking about was actually the doctrines and teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And in verse 13, Christ asked his disciples who people said that he was. Their response, dear listeners, was that some said he was John the Baptist, Elijah, and others said Jeremiah. Now let's hold that thought for a minute and go down to verses 24 through 28. In verse 24, then Jesus said unto his disciples, let's stop right there. Who's doing the talking? To whom is he talking to? The Bible said that Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In verse 25, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Verse 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, folks, watch this. Listen carefully. In verse 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. In verse 28, Verily I say unto you, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Christ was clearly speaking, and he was clearly speaking to his disciples, and he clearly did this 2,000 years ago. Now, did the disciples witness the coming of Christ in his kingdom? Well, if you've listened to my past programs on this subject, you know the answer. Or did he mislead them into thinking something other than was, was actually the truth? If they didn't have those words fulfilled in their lives, then why did Christ even bother to say it to them? Why would he mislead them? Why would he lie to them? And why don't you understand this? Was the whole Bible written to people who were completely kept in the dark? Were they just a bunch of fools? Were they the scapegoats to provide the martyrs so that you could feel good in your church 2,000 years later? I don't think so. Now, before you think that we've ventured into something other than finding Elijah, the promised messenger and the forerunner spoken of by Malachi, let's go to chapter 17. In verse 1 through 7, we find the story of Christ's transfiguration. The disciples were witnesses of God the Father speaking from heaven that Christ was his beloved Son. He was the promised Messiah. He was the Lord's Christ. He was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy concerning the promised King of the Jews, the Redeemer, the Anointed One, the Most High. And in verse 9, he tells his disciples that they should tell no man until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. In verse 10, And his disciples ask him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? In verse 11, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. And in verse 12, 
But I say unto you that Elias is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. And in verse 13, Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Don't you understand? You've all been fooled the way I see it. You may not understand it in that manner, but I see it clearly. Jesus Christ himself said that John the Baptist was the Elijah spoken of by Malachi in Malachi chapter 4. The scribes who were teachers of the Old Testament, they knew the teachings of Malachi. That's why the disciples asked why they were saying that Elijah should come first. One of the reasons that the religious leaders of Christ's day rejected him is because they were so spiritually illiterate that they were expecting some physical return of the Elijah of the Old Testament. They could not see that the fulfillment of the prophecy was of a spiritual nature, and their earthly, fleshly appetites just could not be satisfied by a spiritual application of Bible prophecy. Folks, it absolutely amazes me that religious leaders have never changed their spots from that day till this. Religion still seeks to satisfy the physical, to impose a tax upon the people already burdened by the tax of the state, and to manipulate them as a body politic. All the while, Rejecting the trueness of the spiritual. And if we have time tonight, we'll go back to Schofield to see that Schofield states in black and white that he believes the fulfillment of the Scripture is truly physical and not spiritual. He actually says it. There's a statement in his book. What did the prophets say? That literally made me sick when I read what Schofield, in his own words, says about Christ's kingdom and the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. And if we don't get to it tonight, which we may not, then we'll talk about it tomorrow night. Now remember, this is not a religious broadcast. This broadcast is about truth. And if somebody's teaching us lies about the Bible and what it says, then it's our purpose to reveal that. Not to tell you what to believe. Not to tell you what church you have to worship at. But to try to find the truth. That's all. There was something said a few years ago by a Baptist preacher concerning this lesson on John the Baptist being the Elijah of Malachi. I was talking about Matthew chapter 11 to this preacher when the comment was made to me. In verse 7, the scripture says that Jesus began to teach the multitudes concerning John. He says in verse 10, For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. He goes on to say in verse 14, And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. Would you believe that this Baptist preacher said to me that since the people didn't receive it, then John the Baptist was not really the Elijah that was to come? Incredible! Unbelievable! The preachers in this country, in this day, no more believed the words of Jesus Christ than did the religious leaders who actually heard and saw Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. They stand in their pulpit in front of you in your churches every day and tell you lies when all you have to do is open up your book and read what Jesus says, and he'll clear it right up for you. I've always said on this broadcast, if you want to know the truth about Christianity, read the words in red and nothing else. Everything else is just adjectives and adverbs. The meat of the matter, the subject, is Jesus Christ. Listen to what he said. If Christ were here today, 
the religious leaders of the organized church, of all the organized churches, and all of what is called Christendom, would crucify him today just the same as they did 2,000 years ago. I will bet everything I own. I will bet everything on it. Examine the message that John the Baptist came preaching out of the wilderness. Look at it. It's in Luke chapter 3, verse 3. And he came into the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And in verse 4, as it is written in the words of Esaias the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And in verse 5, Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. And in verse 6, And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Verse 7, Then saith he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Verse 8, Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now watch verse 9. Listen carefully. And now... Also, the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now go back to Malachi chapter 3 and 4 and read again what God told Malachi to tell Israel. Behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. That's nearly word for word what is said in Luke chapter 3 and verse 4. Malachi said that his judgment will be like a refiner or a purifier's fire. Luke 3 verse 9, John the Baptist says that judgment will be by fire. Once again, almost word for word. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1 says that this judgment will leave neither root nor branch. Luke 3 verse 9, and now also the axe is laid on to the root of the trees. It simply cannot get any clearer than this, folks. Are we so blind to truth that we cannot see even this, the simplest of truths? Christ told his disciples that he would die. That what was done to he who had come before, Elijah, John the Baptist, would also be done to him. But that he would come back. He died. He rose three days later and he came back. He then went into his kingdom to sit at the right hand of God, and he has been in his kingdom ever since. Luke 3, verses 16 and 17 says, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the shaft he will burn with fire unquenchable. Who is he talking to? O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He was talking to the generation whose devious acts included the complete and total rejection of God's only Son. God's final offer to Israel was rejected, and it was this final act that determined that God's judgment day of Malachi 4 was indeed to be poured out upon that generation. Do you remember that this brazen generation of evil people were so brassy that they cried, Away with him! 
Away with him, crucify him, crucify him. His blood be upon us and on our children's blood. How prophetic. Indeed, their words were fulfilled. Remember, these were the Hebrews of Israel. My friends, if John the Baptist was not the Elijah of Malachi chapter 4, then someone please take the time to be loving enough to me and my family to straighten me out. If John the Baptist was not the Elijah of Malachi chapter 4, then I need to make a major lifestyle change. If it can be honestly proven from Scripture that John the Baptist was not the Elijah of Malachi 4, then everything that I believe about God's Word will fall like a stack of dominoes that crumbles when the first piece is knocked over. I've asked many, many people to do a simple study of the word generation as it's used in the four Gospels of the New Testament. And it's very interesting to see how it's used and to who the word is spoken to. Since almost all of the teachings of the Gospels can be found within each other, let's look at the word generation from the book of Matthew. We began it Friday. We talked a little about it tonight. And I hope you can take this serious enough to do your own study. Not only Mark, Luke, and John, but throughout the rest of the New Testament. Look who is speaking, and look who is being spoken to. And then listen to what you're being taught today. Ladies and gentlemen, and I think your eyes will fly open. And then finally, you may have some understanding. Don't go away. I'll be right back.
that you'll understand. I'm not preaching to you. I'm not trying to tell you what to believe or that your religion is wrong or that you even have to believe anything at all. I'm trying to arrive at some truth about how far this deception extends. You see, it makes sense that if those who want world government could neutralize their greatest opposition and make them believe that they must not oppose world government because it is being brought about by the hand of God, And indeed, they will have made a tactical victory of the most sublime and of the greatest kind. If they can convince the population of the world that believe in the Bible, and that population is great, if they can neutralize that population so that they will not oppose what is sure to come, based upon all the research that we've done, then they will have their world government because their major enemy will not oppose them. And you hear this every Sunday and every night on every radio station and on satellite and on television. You hear all these preachers and all these organizations and all these Pat Robertsons and everyone else saying, Oh, isn't it marvelous? The world government is coming. It's the fulfillment of prophecy. It's the Word of God being brought into being before our very eyes. Isn't it marvelous? And oh yes, we Christians, we know that we will have to suffer for a while, but then we will be with Jesus and there will be a new heaven and a new earth and Jesus will rule the whole world in one government. How convenient. But you see, what you're being told in church and what you're being told by Pat Robertson and what you're being told by Reverend Schuler in his crystal cathedral filled with the light and what you're being told by Brother Stair, and what you're being told by all these other people, in my research, does not stand up to what the Bible itself says. And if that is true, and I've already proven that it is true, Friday night and Monday night, and I'm going to continue tonight and tomorrow night and Thursday night and possibly Friday night until I've completely covered this and there is no doubt in my mind and I want you to listen and think about this because if I am right then we're faced with a terrible dilemma you see if I am right and so far I know that I am because I have quoted directly from the Bible and it is clear that this is correct but it doesn't mean that you have to believe it, it doesn't mean you even have to believe the Bible and what we know of the Bible's origin, I would advise caution in doing that anyway. But if, if you are a Christian, or if you are a Jew, or any of the other religious organizations, or churches, or groups, or congregations, or whatever you want to call yourself, that believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, then you must believe that the Bible does not lie. And if you are a Christian and you believe that Jesus Christ was God made flesh, who is delivering a message to the world, who was, in fact, the promised Messiah of all the ages, if you believe this, and if you believe that he was crucified, died, sealed in the tomb, and rose three days later. and returned and spoke to his disciples who doubted and then believed and then ascended into heaven to sit upon the right hand of God in his kingdom then you must believe that Jesus Christ could not and did not lie and if that is so then you must believe that your churches and your preachers and your theologians and your <laughs> your evangelists are lying to you. And if you don't want to believe that, 
then how are you going to split yourself down the middle? Because one or the other are clearly not telling the truth. If you believe that your church and your minister and your preacher and your Pat Robertsons and, and your Jerry Falwells and all of these people are telling you the truth, then Jesus had to have lied. And Paul lied. And many others just flat lied. Deceived the people that they were talking to and did not intend the promises that they made to be true. Now, <clears throat> with that in mind, and understanding that we're looking for the truth here, no matter what you believe, and this series of broadcasts should help everyone to understand a little bit better what the Bible is trying to tell us, and what Jesus Christ was all about, and what the true Christian religion should be, bearing in mind that you are not required to believe any of this or even listen to it, and that I certainly will not condemn you no matter what your decision is, because I'm one who believes fully in the Constitution, in free will, and the fact that the choice you make is yours for eternity, and the only one you have to answer to in that choice is God, not me. And that under the Constitution, we are all free to worship, at the altar of our choice to believe whatever it is that we will believe and we all will believe something regardless of what anyone else teaches or preaches or tries to say. So with that in mind, let us continue with our revelations. You see, if Christ was telling his disciples what he told them, and if he was telling them the truth, then this new heaven and new earth and this world government that you're expecting to be led by Christ is a deception. And if it is a deception, I think we had better know about it. Now, we did a simple study of several root words from the original translations on Friday night. And I ask you all to do a simple study of the word generation as it is used in the four Gospels of the New Testament. And I know that some of you did, because I received some calls about it. It is extremely interesting to see how it is used and to who the word is spoken to. You see, this is all about who is speaking and who is being spoken to, and what promises are being made to be carried out when. Since almost all of the teachings of the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, can be found within each other, let's look at the word generation from the book of Matthew. I can only hope that you would take this serious enough to do your own study throughout the entire New Testament. Probably the most interesting usages of the word generation or generations is found in chapter 1. But we're going to skip chapter 1 and go to chapter 3 for the time being. It is a mirror of what we have already seen from Luke chapter 3. Matthew 11, verse 16, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows. And in verse 17, And saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. Verse 18, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, A man gluttonous and a wine-biber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Folks, have you ever heard the phrase, You just can't win for losing? doesn't matter how they come. 
Christ said of the generation that he lived in that even though John the Baptist and Christ himself did opposite things, the Jews were equally critical of each. You see, they found fault with both of these men. It's also interesting to note the next few verses concerning the generation that Christ was living in. In verse 20, the Bible says that he began to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. And in verse 21, Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. And in verse 22, But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And in verse 23, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted into heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. In verse 24, But I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Now, I used to hear preachers make comments concerning America that would go something like this. If God doesn't destroy America because of all its wickedness, then he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Have you ever heard them say these things? But Christ told the generation of Israelites that were alive during his day that they were exceedingly worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah had the wretched Lot as their only hope. The Israelites of Christ's day had God himself. So you see, they didn't come near to repentance. They rejected everything that was good. They rejected the final call from God the Father when they rejected Jesus Christ. You see, Christ was sent to that generation. To that generation. He's not walking around today. He was sent then and there to that people. And he fulfilled his Messiahship. And his work as Messiah is over. You see, it should be blasphemy to say that Christ will return to this earth as Messiah. The redemptive work of Christ the Messiah is over. He died on the cross for the remission of sin of all who believeth in him. If you believe in him, you are saved. And that is what a Messiah does. He doesn't have to come again to do it. He is sitting in his kingdom today. It reminds me of a Baptist anthem that was pounded into my head from my youth. You see, I was baptized in the Southern Baptist Church in Midwest City, Oklahoma at the age of I believe it was 12 or 13. But I remember this anthem from my youth until I finally studied the Bible for myself and saw the glaring error that this song so thoroughly brainwashed me with. It was called, Lift up your head, redemption draweth nigh. And that's a lie. Redemption does not draweth nigh. If I believe in Jesus Christ today and I, I have repented of, of all my wrongs, then my redemption has already occurred. And so has yours. If you believe in this theology. And you don't have to. You see, I believe that God gave us all a free will choice. And that's what this is all about. We all must make a free will choice. And everything is based upon that choice. We make choices every day. We are required to make the right choice every day. We are required to always feel bad about the wrongs that we have done. To repent of those wrongs and to try to make ourselves better, make our lives better, and thus make the lives of all around us better. And thus, that results in a better world. Why would you care? 
You see, because if that is true, then you can't change anything. It's all been decided from the beginning. If God decided in the beginning that you're going to be a bad, sinner, evil, terrible person, then that's what you're going to be and there's nothing you can do about it. If He decided you're going to be a good person or a saint or a pope or a policeman or that you're going to die in a war, then that's what's going to happen to you if you believe that. And that would make everything... Nothing but a joke. Nothing but a big, giant joke. Because it wouldn't matter what you thought or what you did or how much you repented or how good you were or how bad you were. It was decided from the beginning it's not your choice, it's a joke. And you are the butt of the joke. That's why free will must be the truth. Because if all of this is a joke, I don't want any part of it. Do you? If it's all been decided from the beginning, why am I at this broadcasting panel doing what I'm doing? And if I am doing it, it's no reflection on me. It doesn't make me a good, bad, or indifferent person. It was all decided by God in the beginning. Does that make sense to you? It makes perfect sense to me, folks. I'll be right back after this short pause. of that uh, anthem from my youth go like this. Wars and strifes are on every hand, and violence fills the land. Yet some people doubt he'll ever come again, but the word of God is true. He'll redeem his chosen few. Don't lose hope, for Christ's coming draweth nigh. Signs of the times are everywhere. There's a brand new feeling in the air. Keep your eyes upon the eastern sky. Lift up your heads. Redemption draweth nigh. Well, if you understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you understand that this is baloney. And why keep your eyes upon the eastern sky? That's where the sun rises, spelled S-U-N, not S-O-N. And that will give you some idea upon the incorporation of the pagan religions into Christianity by Constantine and the Catholic Church ever since. The reason I cite the Catholic Church is at one time it was the only church, period. The pantheon of gods became the pantheon of saints. There used to be a god for travelers, a god for sickness, A God for shoemakers, now they're all saints. But they're the same thing. And I'm not trying to insult you if you're a Catholic. If you choose to believe these things, that's fine with me. But you have to understand where they came from. This sounds more to me like the ancient messianic religion of the nomadic tribes. They believe that their Messiah has never come and that when He does, then they will be redeemed and they're going to be scammed like everybody else. There will be a Messiah, but it won't be Jesus and it won't be their promised Messiah either. And it won't be Shirley MacLaine who says that she is God. <laughs> no, it'll be a human being just like all the rest of us who will live, who will grow old, who will be wrinkled, and who will eventually die. But they'll work their scam as long as they can. 
Now, the Baptists that I grew up with are saying that the Messiahship of Jesus Christ will take place at this supposed rapture. This is a word that doesn't even appear in the Bible, not once. Where did it come from? People are always calling and telling me, why do you, why do you exert so much energy into this if you're really one of Christ's church? You're going to be raptured. You don't have to worry about this. Well, I do have to worry about it because it's not even in the Bible. Not even once. Can it be found anywhere? They've denied the work of Jesus Christ while he was here. And they have adopted the Jewish belief that the Messiah is yet to come. And the organized religious church is powerless because they have never met the one who gives the power. They're lining up... <laughs> with this New Age religion waiting on their promised Messiah. And the New Age is called Maitreya. If all of what we have read in the Bible, the real words, not what some person behind a podium is telling you, if all of what we have read were somehow Bible prophecy, the generation of religious teachers could easily be compared with those of Matthew 11 and 23. Matthew chapter 12 is the next place that we find generation. Christ had been arguing with the Pharisees concerning the lawfulness of the Sabbath. I know I wanted to talk about that tonight. You see, all of you know, if you read the Bible, that Christ was crucified, died, was sealed in the tomb for three days. In fact, Christ says before he is crucified that just as Jonah was three days in the belly of, whale, of the whale, so will he be three days in the earth. Three days, folks. So if he was crucified on a Friday, he could not have risen from the grave on a Sunday, as you have all been told. It's impossible. That's not three days. Not only that, but the Bible is clear that he rose on the Sabbath. The Sabbath. The Sabbath is Saturday. Saturday, folks. So what's going on here? So it could not have risen on Sunday. And it wasn't Easter anyway. Easter is the old pagan religious holiday of the vernal equinox. The spring rites of fertility of the goddess Ishtar. It has nothing to do with Christ or Christianity. If you study the Bible, Christ was not crucified on Easter or even near it. Neither was he born on Christmas Day, which is the winter solstice. You see, these are all pagan celebrations of the religion of the sun god. The Christmas tree comes from the pagan religions of northern Europe. And I could go on and on and on. Christianity has been so intertwined with the old pagan religions in order that it not fail, and it was done intentionally by the church to bring in those who would not come in unless they could bring the important parts of their pagan religions. And it's okay with me if you believe that. I think, though, that if we're looking for the truth, we should understand why we believe it and where it came from. You see, back in those days, the ordinary Jewish people were beginning to believe Christ's words. And that's another thing. You see this word Jew and Jewish in the Bible. It was never there. Up until late. They were the Israelites. They were the Hebrew people. All of a sudden, 
in a period in European history, the Bible began to be translated, and this word Jew and Jewish began to show up. Where did it come from and why? This is something that most of you don't know. It was not there before. In fact, that word does not even exist in the original writings of the Hebrews and the Greeks, wherein we get the original translations of the Bible. So the ordinary Israelites were beginning to believe Christ's words until the religious leaders told them what was really the truth. In verse 23, the people asked, Is not this the son of David? The Pharisees were quick to respond that Christ did what he did through Satan instead of God. Christ then begins to tell them that attributing the work of God to Satan is an incredible affront to God. In verse 30, Christ says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. In verse 31, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. In verse 32, And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven of him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. And note, folks, the word world here is the same word used in Matthew 24, verse 3, which means aeon or age. In verse 33, Either make the tree good, or else make the tree corrupt, and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. In verse 34, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. In verse 35, A good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. In verse 36, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. In verse 37, For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Were not these the same Israelites that said, quote, His blood be upon us and on our children's blood, end quote. And you get all these guys running around trying to say that you're the chosen people of God and that you are the true Israelites and the ones who really speak Hebrew and the ones who worshipped in the ancient method of the Israelites or not. I want to caution you. His blood be upon us and on our children's blood. Verse 38, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. And in verse 39, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And in verse 40, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He doesn't equivocate. He says three days and three nights. And in verse 41, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here is here, not coming. In verse 42, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Is here, not coming at some distant future date. In verse 34, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. In verse 44, Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. In verse 45, Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. 
He doesn't say some future generation. He says this wicked generation, speaking to those people then about that time and that generation existing 2,000 years ago. So Christ has essentially said that the generation of Israelites that he came to was worse than all of the other generations of Israelites from the past. And after reading all of those, and Jesus said unto them, now, how can we not believe most simply that he was talking to and meant every word to those Israelites that he was sent to? And Jesus said unto them, not unto you. He didn't say, and Jesus said unto those living 2,000 years in the future. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 4, he again tells them that wicked and adulterous generations seek after signs, but the sign of Jonas our Jonah was going to be the only one given. And that, of course, was the sign that was given when Christ died, was buried, stayed dead for three days and three nights, and then rose again. In Matthew verse, chapter 17, verse 17, he calls them a faithless and perverse generation. He asked them how long he should be with them and how long would he put up with them. Now, we're still, still talking, folks about what we started out talking about, the word generation. And the next time we find it is in Matthew 23. But Matthew 23 is such a key chapter, we need to go through it from the beginning and then work toward verse 36, where we find the word generation. Verse 1 tells us again, very plainly, that Jesus was talking to the multitude and to his disciples, not to you, not to me, if you'll take the time to read it for yourself, you'll see that Christ is absolutely blasting the religious leaders of the Israelites. Up one side and down the other, he is angry with them. And he talks of how they love to be seen of men. He talks about how they try to carry on as Moses did. But the truth is that they didn't have a clue concerning the life that Moses spoke of. In verse 13, he goes on an all-out lambasting of the scribes and Pharisees. He says that they shut up the kingdom of God against men. They devour widows' houses and they pray long prayers for an outward showing. They cross the seas to make a proselyte of someone. And when they succeed, they end up making the proselyte twofold more the child of hell than themselves. He calls them fools and blind. He calls them blind guides that strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. He says that they try to clean up their outward appearances, but inside they are full of extortion and excess. He says that they are whited sepulchers which appear beautiful on the outside, but on the inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. So, I guess you could say that he was uh, pretty pissed off at those dudes. To put it in a language that I know every one of you out there will understand. He was not happy with the religious leaders of his day. And quite frankly, I think he would be even less happy with the religious leaders of this day. Because they're all lying if Jesus is not. Now, we've almost arrived at the point in which we set out for at the beginning. He tells them in verse 30, And say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. In verse 31, Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Verse 32, Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Verse 33, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? In verse 34, wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Now, Watch this, folks, and listen very carefully. Verse 35. That upon you 
may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. And in verse 36, Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. And in verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. And in verse 38, Behold, your house, is left unto you desolate. Folks, I don't see any possible way that the words of Jesus Christ in this chapter can be attributed to any generation except for the generation in which he was speaking to. Of course, the religious leaders of Christ's day did not believe that his words were meant for them. Therefore, it only makes sense that the religious leaders of our day would have us to believe that these words were spoken for some other future generation. They'd love you to believe that. Because as Schofield says, we know that the word generation here could not possibly refer to the generation of Christ's day because the promise of the gospel being preached to all nations has never occurred. The ugly, awful truth, folks, is the religious leaders of Christ's day that shut up the kingdom of heaven against men are still doing it today. It's not the exact same group of men, because they died 2,000 years ago, and they wore robes. Today they wear suits and ties. They are still the cleanest and sharpest looking on the outside, but their inwardness is still the same. They have denied the Christ of the New Testament in favor of the coming Christ, the Messiah of the Israelites. And as long as I've been alive, I've heard one preacher after another say that he wasn't setting dates, but then proceed to tell us when the second coming of Christ was to occur. One of the main dates that I remember was 1981. Then it was 84. Then it was 88. Now, I guess I hear sometime by the year 2000, and it's being preached on all your TV sets and all your churches all over the world. What a joke. They base all of their ideologies on different passages of scriptures, Old and New Testament. The truth is they don't have a clue. Yet they continue on and all of the little church sheeple follow along. It makes sense to me though, folks, that if the event already took place, then we could look at certain scriptures in order to make guesses about the second coming. Funny thing, the greatest evidence of scripture causes us to end up at guess what time? Would you believe around the time of the generation that Christ said would see his coming? Amazing, isn't it? And uh, it is indeed amazing. Now, whenever I do this kind of broadcast, ladies and gentlemen, it either brings out the very worst or the very best in people. And so when we open the phones now, I'm going to predict that we're going to get some kind of a mix of raving religious fanatic lunatics, good thinking, educated people, and then a plethora of somewhere in between. Now, please remember, all of you, if this broadcast has upset you in your religious beliefs, it is not because of what I said, but because you, yourself, discovered some truth in what was said that challenged the very foundation of your religious beliefs. If it did not, it would not bother you. It's no different than when I get letters from people protesting the use of the word sheeple and describing them. And I have to laugh because I was describing the sheeple. If they believed 
that when I used the word sheeple, I was describing them, it's because they are sheeple. If I'm walking down a street and someone yells, Stop that robber! Stop that bank robber! Stop him! I'm not going to start running because I think they're after me because I didn't rob the bank. I hope you understand that. The purpose of this broadcast was to challenge you to think about what your religious leaders are teaching you. Not to try to tell you what to believe. Remember, I believe in freedom. And I don't care what God you worship or what art, altar you worship at. As long as in the doing of it you never hurt the person or property of any other human being. And as long as in the doing of it you are not trying to bring about some socialist slave state in which you are going to imprison me in your ideology. So, with those clarifications in mind, we will now open the phones. 520-333-4578. That's 520-333-4578. Four five seven eight is the number, and uh, we'll keep the conversation tonight confined to the subject matter of tonight's broadcast. So, if you have uh, comments on what you heard, I, for one, will be very interested in hearing them. Shortly after we went on the air. Ladies and gentlemen, I received a call from someone who had only heard just a few sentences of the opening remarks of the broadcast, who told me, quite politely, that he believed that I had taken a long walk off a short metaphysical pier. <laughs> and he could be right. I don't know. All I know is I quoted the Bible accurately, I quoted Jesus Christ accurately, and if I quoted them accurately, and they're saying something other than what we're being taught today, then either someone today is lying to us, or the Bible is lying to us. There isn't any in between, because the words are clear, and the meaning of those words is also clear. Good evening, you're on the air. Bill. Yes, ma'am. Renee in Michigan, how are you? I'm fine. You know what, I'm, I'm so excited, I got my hair standing up on end. Really? <laughs> I mean, it's like, listening to what you've been saying is like, you know, I've been looking and searching for the truth for so long, and it's like this big burden's been lifted. And, you know, from what you were reading from the Bible... You know, I always found it interesting that when I would read it, I would have the same feeling of he's talking about these people to these people at that time. But somehow, what you had heard in your church or from your parents or from other people always steered you away from that. Is that correct? Yes. And when I was brought up, um, I was brought up believing in God and believing in Jesus Christ. Most of my life, that's basically what I've believed. I've never been indoctrinated into any particular church because mm -hmm. I've always walked away feeling something wasn't right. And now I feel it was a blessing that I never was indoctrinated. Well, indoctrination in a religion, especially if it's done at a very early age, mm -hmm. is nothing less than brainwashing. Well, yeah, and I mean, you're not saying God doesn't exist and that Jesus Christ isn't real and that, that he's not the Son of God, but if he told his disciples that some of them would see him uh, in his kingdom, well, he didn't lie to them because they saw him when he rose. Yes, not only that, he said that some of those here will not, and I'm paraphrasing, but what he said, will not experience death until I am in my kingdom. Yeah, so he's already come the second time. 
That's exactly correct. So he I came think, once. He was born of the Virgin Mary. Right. And he came the second time well, after his resurrection. Right. So it's perfect for the quote unquote New World Order for all these Christians to run around believing that Christ is coming back because whatever they're going to do to make it look like there's a return of Christ, these people are all going to be fooled. I mean, do you know how many people in this world believe that? Yes, I, I'm well aware of that. I believe in, in, in God and Christ in all my heart. And when I die, yes, I, w I want to be in his kingdom. And I guess my question is now, for people, and, and I may be getting ahead of what you're um, discussing, is it for us now that we will live and basically die and go to heaven? Listen to me very carefully. He is in his kingdom. Okay, so he's he was in his kingdom when he ascended into heaven. He went to sit at the right hand of God, mm -hmm. and he took his place at the head of his kingdom. And there was a new heaven and a new earth, and all the prophecies came to pass. Right. And whomsoever believeth in me shall have everlasting life. So that's where we will be. Absolutely. Than him. Well, it definitely has taken a load off of my shoulders. And, you know, the thing is, we have been taught this other story. You've been taught to wait for the kingdom to come. That no matter what happens, you're, 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 not, uh, you're not taken care of. You're taken care of according to what it says in the New Testament. You're taken care of the moment that you confess right. and remit of all your sins and believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Well, the thing that I've always looked at, and I've talked to different ministers, I said, you know, my whole life I believe in God, Jesus Christ. That's been the very basic part of my whole belief. I've never gotten into all the legalistic stuff or the... The, all the stuff in the Bible and all the different doctrines and I know that, that Christ has been in my life all my life because he has done so much for me that I've gone back to just that basic belief because when I got started to get caught up in all this other stuff I started losing it sure and, and it's, it's so simple believe in him that's it. That's right. Go, go and read what he says, yeah. believe that he's telling the truth, and forget about all this other crap that people are trying to shove in your ears. It's like now we're dealing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees all over again. You better believe it. Remember I told you that if you're a Christian, you cannot possibly be afraid to die? Right. I'm not afraid to die. I'm just not too happy about how it might happen. <laughs> well, it, it doesn't make any difference. Not you, really, you cannot. No. You cannot be afraid to die. No. If, if you really believe in Jesus and believe in what he said. Remember he said, whosoever, who chooses life shall not find it, right. and whosoever dieth in my name shall have life. Right. Well, there's times with the things that are going on in the world today, sometimes I wonder, you know. Well, they want you to be afraid I, because I then... sooner than later. <laughs> they want you to be afraid because then they can enslave you. If right. you have no fear of death, you are the greatest enemy they could ever conceive of. Right. And you're not afraid. And so that you can confront them in a manner that they cannot possibly confront you because they don't believe in God. Right. They don't believe in a life after death. Mm -hmm. And they are afraid oh, of yeah, dying. Where they're going when they die. <laughs> you know, well, for us, the thing that we have is Christ. Yes. You know, that, that's, that's, that's the our only army we need. But see, according to what it says in the Bible, if you believe the Bible, there's a lot of people listening who don't, if you believe what it says in the Bible, those who do not believe and who are not saved aren't going anywhere when they die. They cease to exist. Right. right. Hell was created by a man named Dante when he wrote Dante's Inferno. Right. And, and the thing is, everlasting life is a gift. Yes. It, it, and, though, and, and I don't believe that even for God's wicked children, that he's going to have them hanging around in hell, burning 
forever. I mean, everlasting life. That's still well, everlasting what, what, life. What's, what's the point of that? No. There's <laughs> The, the point is, is to make the choices and separate the wheat from the chaff. And it has nothing to do with the wheat being a specific race. It is, whosoever believeth in me shall have everlasting life. Yeah. Not whosoever believeth in me, that is Christian identity, shall have everlasting life. Not whosoever believeth in me, who is Jewish, shall have everlasting life. Not whoever believeth in me, who is white, shall have everlasting life. Not whosoever believeth in me, who is black, shall have everlasting life. But, listen carefully, whosoever believeth in me, shall have everlasting life. Well, and I think Satan has done a very good job of destroying from within, because you have all these... We're all children of God, so what, what the heck is the deal with all this denomination stuff? Well, I'll tell you what. When, 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 when the, the evil power can convince everybody that when they're reading the words in the Bible, that they mean something other than what they say, right. he's done a damn good job, in my estimation. But i can let you go so we can get some other people in Thanks, here. Phil. Great show. Thank you. It was prompted by all the calls last night. That's why I did it. There's some very, you know, curious people out there. Good evening. You're on the air. Yes, Bill. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, 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 very great tonight. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, you know, the gal you rubbed horns with last night was my wife. Really? Uh, well, I didn't want to rub horns with her. It's just that... She didn't understand where I was coming from. She thought I was attacking her religion personally, and, and, I, and I certainly was not doing that. Right, and that, I, I told her you guys just weren't connecting. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'll tell you what it is, Bill. We've heard so much garbage out there, uh, ranging from everything from Mark Bell, and we don't listen to him anymore, by the way. Uh, Good for you. You'll, you'll have a lot more sanity in your life. Right, patriots. And she got a little, a little paranoid. We all are, you know, in these days. Uh, you know. Well, when you ever have any doubts, don't listen to me. If you're a Christian, go to your Bible, That's right. open it up, and read the words in red. And I wanted to address what you were saying tonight. You know, Jesus is, they all have Jesus off coming someday. Right? Mm hmm. Okay. And Christ says that. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a little nervous, Bill, excuse me. That's okay. I am, too. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I always get nervous when I do a show on religion, because I don't have any idea what the outcome of it's going to be. Right. If they say, lo, I am over here, do not go. If I am over here, do not do, go. You know, you know the scripture. Yes. For the kingdom of heaven is where? Within you. That's right. Within you. Now, if you go to John 17... That's right. And he's in his kingdom. Other, the kingdom exists. I in you, you in me, yeah. he in you. So if he's in me, how, where, where's he at? These people are always putting Christ off into the future. Yeah. You know what it reminds me of, Bill? It reminds me of these telethons for muscular districts. <laughs> that have $10 billion, billions of dollars pouring that year yeah. after year. That's right. And they never find a cure because as long as they can put the cure off, they can keep that money basket going sure. around. Sure. And look at the look at the suit that Pat Robertson wears. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Man, if I could, I couldn't even walk into the store where that suit is sold. Well, I, you know, you know that, you know that uh, Shirley MacLaine, uh, you know uh, that treatise limb that she's out on. Uh, maybe it was strong enough to support uh, the Farwell too. <laughs> well, I don't know. You see, I think they get out on that limb, and yeah. I, I think they saw it off behind them, and they they don't even really know it. Yeah, Bill, could you hold up, Bill? Yes. Here. Yeah, uh, Bill. Yes, ma'am. I was listening to you tonight, and I'm glad to hear that uh, you do believe the way I believe. Uh, in fact, uh, there's, this is not being taught or preached nowhere. There's only been two other men in my whole entire life that I have known that have been preaching this truth other than when I heard you tonight. Uh, but like that one lady who was just speaking to you, I noticed she still mentioned the word that she hopes to be in in uh, uh, the, you know, the Father's kingdom someday. Yeah, well, she's there right now if she right. does. the kingdom of God is within you. Yes, and it exists it, today, and it began upon his ascension into heaven yes. after his resurrection. That's right, and greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm in the Father.
Father and the Father in me, and I in you. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Yes. Jesus Christ is in us and with us, and there's going to be no rapture. No. <laughs> the only rapture there's going to be is maybe a raptor, and that's the one that's going to be taken away by the false antichrist. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I do, but I, we got to get some more people in here. I really thank you for your call. Uh-huh. Thank you. Five two zero three 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 four five seven eight. The reason I'm trying to cut people a little short tonight is because we're up against the top of the last hour. And so if there's people who want to call, I want to try to get as many of them in as possible. It's five two zero three 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 four five seven eight. Remember, folks, I believe in freedom. I don't care what you believe. I want you to try to believe whatever you believe based upon truth and not what somebody else is shoving in your ears, ramming it in there and, and forcing you to believe it or brainwashing you to believe it or whatever. You should believe it because you have personally investigated it and you believe it's true. And if you believe that and you believe that your God is a tree and uh, every night you have to go out and pour water on the roots... As long as you are not injuring the person or property of any other human being, it's okay with me. God is the one that we all have to answer to. And it wouldn't be funny if I died and found out that God was your tree. I don't think that's going to happen, because I think that I'm coming from a point of truth. Doesn't mean that I am, but it means based upon my research, that I believe that it is. Remember, all religion is based upon, ultimately, faith. And can neither be proved nor disproved. So we have to go on what we have laid in front of us. I believe in God. I believe there must be a God. I believe that if I didn't believe in God, I would have to start believing in God so that man would have to have a higher force to answer to other than himself, because if man only has to answer to himself, bad things happen. 520-333-4578. And we've got uh, time for several more calls, should you desire to uh, call in and tell us how you feel about tonight's broadcast. Remember, we've got to stick to the subject. I don't care if you're an atheist and you want to call and tell me what you think. I don't care if you belong to some other religion and you want to call and tell me what you think. I don't care if you're like the gentleman who called after he heard three or four sentences at the beginning of the program who called uh, to tell me that he thought that I had taken a long walk off a short metaphysical pier. Actually, I wasn't dealing with metaphysics at all. I was m merely comparing what we've been taught today with what Jesus really said and with what the Bible really says. And so we can't be hovering in between there. Either these people are telling us the truth today and the Bible is lying, and Jesus lied, or Jesus and the Bible is telling the truth, and all of these preachers running around today are sharing the sheeple, which is I, what I believe is really happening. And I believe it very, very strongly. Five two zero three 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 four five seven eight. Good evening. You're on the air. Uh, yes, Bill. This is Louise near Chicago. Hi, Louise. I heard you mention that, that the hell of flames and torment was Dante's. Yes, Dante is the one who who invented the modern version of the devil with the pointed tail and the pitchfork the actual and burning in the flames and all of this kind of stuff. Okay, it all, but all Louis, came from uh, Dante's... The 15, verse 22 mentions the rich man Excuse being me. Hell. Excuse me. If you won't interrupt me when I'm talking, I won't interrupt you when you're talking. Okay? Dante, if you'll read Dante's Inferno, before that book came out and was devoured by the Protestant community... These ideas of a red devil with a pointed tail and horns and souls burning in eternal uh, fire in front of some furnace being tended by the devil did not exist. Well, what about in the Bible itself that mentions it? What, where does it mention it? What does it say? I was saying, Luke chapter 16, verse 22, I am tormented in this flame. 
in hell and in Revelation. The smoke of this torment ascended up forever and ever. What was the original translation? That's what you have to go back to. Oh, well, that's what I don't have a copy of, unfortunately. I wish I did. The original translation is why am I tormented in this, in this flame in Gehenna. What is Gehenna? Uh, I've heard the term. Ge I've always thought it meant hell. No. Well, that's, that's what's been translated. But in the old, old original uh, Hebrew and Greek, there was no such thing as hell. Gehenna is a valley or a little canyon outside of Jerusalem where they took the dead bodies to dispose of them. By burning? Sometimes by burning. They dumped their trash there. Lepers lived there. And it was, it was a bad place. Uh -huh. But that's what it was. Okay, so really then what I need to do is get an original translation to learn uh, Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek. Yeah, you have to understand that the Bible has undergone so many different translations, about at least 350, and you have to go back as close to the original text as you possibly can in order to understand what was really meant. Okay. For instance, in the Bible today where it says the end of the world, in the original text, it does not say anything like that. It says the end of an age okay. or the end of a time. What's the most accurate Bible I can get now that will come closest to that that you know of? Well, there really isn't any. You have to go back to the original Greek or Hebrew. And there's no, there's no compilation or anything? They're all corrupted in their translations. Well, yeah, and it, that's true. The age of deception. Yes. Oh, this is getting more difficult than uh, and, and the more, previously imagined. And the, and the more modern the Bible, the more corrupt it is. Well, then working backwards, one could say the older the translation, that's like, that's like using the old Webster's Dictionary for that matter. That's right. The farther back you go toward the original, the more you get, or the closer you get to the truth. Probably a Geneva Bible or something older. Okay, well, thanks a lot. You're welcome. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you for calling. Yeah, folks, when the Bible talks about hell, you go back to the original translations. The word is not hell. It's Gehenna, which was a valley outside of Jerusalem where they burned trash, dumped dead bodies, and sometimes burned them. Lepers lived there. Whoops. It was ringing, and then it was gone. Five two zero three. Well, gee, you know, we're at the end. So, I hope that somehow I inspired you all to think. Now remember, I was not trying to change your beliefs or, or tell you your religion is wrong or, or make you believe anything. What I was trying to do was point out some major discrepancies and get you to think independently of what somebody else is telling you. And I hope that you're all able to do that. Good night, and God bless each and every single one of you. And, uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll relieve you of this subject on the way out. So, uh,
You're listening to 101.1 FM Eager. Classic radio like you always wished it could be. 101.1 FM is your community service, non-profit radio station. If you'd like to write a letter to 101.1 FM, here's the address. It's P.O. Box 940, Eager, Arizona, 85... Jumped the gun there. Eager, Arizona, 85925. That's 101.1 FM, P.O. Box 940. Eager, Arizona, 85925. 